Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to Seekistan. Today's new show is brought to you by the Seek Strength Weightlifting Camp and S&C Camp in Portugal in Praia de Luz in May. Details are on the screen and in the description below and also, of course, brought to you by the Seek Strength app on iOS and Android. Starting off today's new show, we've got the return of Toshiki. So Toshiki might remember had a surgery on his leg. He was one of the bones in his leg. I can't remember which one. Which, do you remember which bone? I think it was a tibia. I think it was his tibia and they put in a metal bar and it hasn't really healed right since. That was, I think, just over two years ago and we were in Japan last year. We had the pleasure of training with Toshiki for a few days and it wasn't really great then. He was limping when he was walking. He said he wanted to come back to lifting at some point and here he put up this 200 kilo for sets of five by five and then he did some drop sets if you watch a full video on his youtube but here is a video of uh, the 200 one of the sets of 200 in his own little pt studio mm. which we didn't get to see no i think what's hard here is tashiki's obviously known for his squatting that's yeah. his that's his thing obviously he had a real specific kind of aesthetic technique with the lift but everybody watched tashiki for his squats Obviously, in the last couple of years, he's gotten into bodybuilding in a massive way and seems to have really progressed very well in bodybuilding. But I'd say it's always in the back of his mind that I'm going to get back to big squats one day, even though he's had a catastrophic leg injury. So apparently when he was in the hospital and they did the x-ray and they like ran out after him and put him into a wheelchair because they're like, it looks like your leg could break at any point because basically it looked like Swiss cheese. That was essentially from training. He seemed to have exclusively given himself that from an overuse injury. So an extreme case of shin splints from being an absolute monster on the squat. So 200 sets of five. I really hope he's able to keep pushing and go somewhere again. He said in a recent video he wants to squat 300 kilos again, and I've no doubt he will. You know, if he can get back to these weights pain-free, hopefully... That means he can keep progressing. Now, one of his arch nemesis is 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 is, is <laughs> arch nemesis is squatting two hundred kilos for a double. This is, I would say, possibly the biggest, if not the biggest, training block of Tianto's life. Surely, certainly the most pressure, the most on the line. So he's put this two hundred kilo rainbow bar for a double here up on his Instagram. He said wearing Lu Zhao knee pads after practicing deep bragging can only fathom what that was supposed to mean but beautiful as always yeah i think look it's it's not unheard of to say that these two last squatters are probably two of the most aesthetic squatters in the world mm -hmm. they're definitely two of the most popular squatters tian's squat in my opinion it's tian tian yeah people keep giving out to you for saying tian I, I wouldn't blame them what's the oh thai and t instead of thai tian so Tian Squat is... And, I, and I'm, I'm not one for the names now, to be honest myself. <laughs> is definitely in one of the best places I've ever seen it. Yeah, yeah. Like, he is, he is flying through the weights. Also, the big thing for me is that it wasn't that long ago we saw a 290 kilo squat single that looked kind of difficult from him. That's yeah. probably only three, four months ago. Now he's in here smashing 300 kilos. It's, uh, it's good to see. Hopefully, hopefully... This training block pays off for him. So we'll have Thailand in, I think, like two weeks now, or a week and a half, maybe. So that's the last chance qualifier for a lot of them and where the Chinese team obviously have to prove themselves as much as some of the athletes. And hopefully I've said Tian's name right. <laughs> maybe we're saying it wrong all the time. We say lots of names wrong. But 300, obviously Tian is one of the best squatters literally ever, certainly in the realm of weightlifting, you know, that 321. Mm. Is, is up there with literally possibly top five maybe, maybe even higher depending on what his body weight was at the time. What I feel like at the moment is it's like on the Titanic and they're just shoveling coal in and they're like, we have to make more power now, you know? Yeah. It's a Titanic look. The ti oh, a little wordplay. So one of his former arch nemesis is a nemesis, but obviously has been on the international scene for a long time in the 85 group, now probably an 89 somewhere. Archim Okolov is training. A lot of the Russian teams seem to be training a bit more recently, seeing a few videos, not too much. And this is 160 kilos, four plus four, so four cleans and four jerks in typical Archim fashion with mm. that superb jerk. Yeah, and this is my favorite iteration of Archim's jerk when he's doing a lot of reps. And he has that small pause in between. You see how phenomenal the lock it is. You see how sharp his technique is on every single rep. Obviously, this is way below maximal numbers from 
but just how sharp each one is, how fast each one is, and that small pause in between really makes it stand out for me. So someone was asking a recent video we just put up at the weekend of what I thought Archer's possible peak could have been, and it's really hard to know. I kind of felt like he never got the opportunity to fully peak for the biggest competitions in the way classes he was in or when he was leading up to them, you know. So obviously they were leading up for Rio would have probably been one of his best peaks, I would imagine. And, you know, the Russians are very cautious with their peaking and are very precise with their planning. They seem to plan things out quite long ahead, like a lot of great athletes do, obviously. So who knows what he could have done in the 85 kilo class and what he might have been doing in the 89s now, probably. So realistically, we'll never know. I don't see Russia coming back to the competition anytime soon. So unfortunately, I would say we'll probably never see Archie on the international scene again in a meaningful way, which is odd, but that's how things ended up. Here we've got Ollie Saxton, a Australian mate lifter, an up-and-coming young lifter. I'm pretty sure he's in his early 20s, if not younger, with this 280 kilo back squat, and I think this is a PB for him. Ah, it's absolutely phenomenal. Obviously, Ali's been on the scene for the last couple of years, lifting monstrous weights, really fast and very, very powerful. This is definitely the heaviest squad I think I remember seeing from him. It's it's very nice overall. I think it's his dad coaches him. Oh, is it? I think so, or something like that. Yeah, very nice squad, very smooth and very consistent squad at 280. So more than enough for some big numbers, you know, maybe probably 170, 200-ish, maybe 210-ish. That's certainly enough of a squat. And he's a, a feisty lifter, full of piss and vinegar if you watch his lifting. So he could definitely make it happen. So it'll be interesting to see where his lifting goes over the next couple of years. Now, here we have got a Turkmenistan lifter, Bek Tamur, with this 158-kilo snatch. Uh, very, very nice snatching in Great Nick as well. So... Seen back to more a few times on the competition platform, but he doesn't seem to upload too much training footage. So it was nice to see this 158 kilo snatch in what looks to be the ballroom of a hotel. <laughs> this is crispy cream. Yeah. This is absolutely gorgeous. As you're watching the pull, it is a quite slow pull. It's kind of a, a characteristically slow pull, but that lockout and particularly the speed of that pull under just makes this absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I wish I wish just more lifters all the time would upload more training, mm. more Instagram footage. The the want is there for it. I, I wish there was it. a little Google AdSense like there is for YouTube, you know. Mm -hmm. And every time you put up it's like per kilo lifted. Yeah. The snatch is worth a bit more than the clean and jerk. Clean and jerk's worth a bit more than the front squat. Whatever. I'd love to see it. He's also quite young as well. Now, here we've got Jan Hack, and Jan put up some big numbers last year when he moved up to the 102s, but then he had a bit of an injury that seemed to knock him back slightly, and he's been obviously on the ramp up now for Thailand and maybe the Olympics. We don't really know who's going to go from Team South Korea. Jan did this 180 and 210, and he's done 190 from blocks, and we've seen him clean and jerk 220 before as well. And Jan is a tenacious lifter, I would say. Feisty again. The crazy thing about this is you consider it's around eight months ago we were over there mm -hmm. nine months ago we were over there and he wasn't even doing full training sessions he was just kind of doing some rehab work doing lighter lifts was very much definitely still injured then and then going back for 180 210 this close to the olympics is phenomenal work so he had i think he had a calf injury last year when we saw him the funniest story was he was training and obviously we were staying out of the way and just watching the sessions and it was a pretty rainy, gloomy day. And he walked down to us and sat down next to me and said, the weather is shit. But I was like, there's no way this South Korean athlete just came down and said the weather is shit. I was like, that must have been, that surely was something in Korean that sounds like the English phrase that an Irish person would say to another Irish person. But it actually turns out that's exactly... It's exactly what he said. That's why he's saying the lifts weren't too big either. So yes. It's raining outside. Weather's terrible. No, he said weather is shit. Yeah, He yeah. said the phrase, the weather is shit. So <laughs> that's why you now he's my favorite lifter ever. He also called me a sexy boy, so I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> so sticking with the Russians, or back to the Russians, we've got the Russian youth team. So these might be some of the lifters we might see in the future on the international competition platform if they return back to the international team. You know, if these are the youth team, these are all teenagers, maybe some juniors in here as well. There doesn't seem to be any 
you know, any freaks, any young Archimokhlovs, Katai Kugevs, Aptis in here just yet. But there could be. There might not be seeing them. Some of these look vaguely familiar, some of these lifters. But it'll be interesting to see if any of these lifters are the, the future of the team. And it's good to see they still have a U team active. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that does kind of stand out for me here is there's different technical models being followed here Mm -hmm. which you wouldn't typically like we always talk about like the german model everybody lifts the exact same way the russians obviously had some disparities between the athletes and i think that's a factor more so of the country being so gigantic and people being a bit more spread out but we definitely see a few different models being followed here or a few different techniques uh slightly different from each other that maybe in years previously they would have been a bit more homogenous I think there might be anatomical differences looking at the yes. lifters more than tactical. So they're all in that massive national training center, which Klokov and Dmitry Brestov used to hold their camps in, I think. Mm. And, you know, I'm just very happy to see that they have a team. I'm very happy to see that Russia are still supporting me in that way. You know, politics aside, it is the more national countries with big systems that support their team of athletes and younger athletes, the better it is for weightlifting, you know, regardless of the outcome or who wins, the more people involved. And currently in weightlifting, we're not in danger of losing superstars, but the 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 best of the best is kind of becoming a slightly smaller group in terms of all-time performance in the last kind of six or seven years, you know, so it is important that you have superstars, that you have the best of the best, you know, and you have like all-timers lifting throughout and so the one of the ways to do that is obviously big systems lifting putting their athletes through it you know because it's a kind of a numbers game at certain stage you don't know who's an all-timer or close to an all-timer great until you just put those numbers through the system and it's very very important to have those for lifting you know the farther they get from the average person the better it is for the lifting in the sport in terms of people to inspire aspire to so it is very very important now speaking of someone who is a unit and he's a uh, quite a young lifter still and putting up huge numbers is Don Opeloge. I feel like I feel like that's how feel that, like you nailed it. No, I feel like I didn't nail it. Oh. Anyway, here's a 224 kilo clean and jerk. I'm pretty sure this is a PB clean and jerk for Don. I'm I'm almost certain it is. So he's moved up to the 102s obviously for the Olympics and I'm sure he's in the top 10 for the Oceania region. He's getting his numbers right up there. Yes. Like he is, uh, obviously that, that there's a lot of competition in that weight class. Uh, there's Miso is there. Obviously Akbar is there. But the numbers aren't far off at all. Yeah. Like he's, it's not a 230 clean and jerk, but it's still right up there, especially with right up there with what second attempts or final attempts are going to be. Yeah, like we haven't seen anyone clean and jerk 230 or more in the 102 class in a while, you know, mm. Akbar, Miso, Jan, none of them are like guaranteed, they're very likely some of them to do 230 or more, but most of them are probably going to hit in the 220s, everyone knows how the Olympics goes, everyone knows how the pressure and all the other factors involved in trying to peak perfectly for the Olympics put a lot of pressure on, so we just you just don't ever see the whole class come out perfect, you see some great lifters, we see things like you know, the 85 kilo class in 2016 was a great example of everyone coming out top notch. But most of the time, more often than not, people get it wrong than right. And that's why it's the Olympics, you know, to to perform on that massive stage. So it's not out of the possibility for Dan to hit a medal for Samoa, maybe a bronze, because he has a good snatch as well. So who knows what will happen? Yeah, absolutely. And the nature of weightlifting as well is things go wrong on the day all the time. Do they what? <laughs> the, the bomb squad. Now, sticking in the Oceania region, we have this 17-year-old crossfitter, power cleaning jerking, Gabby Napper, 105 kilos, and power jerking it. Now, not only is the power clean a power clean, it's also very high. It's like yeah. almost a standing <laughs> power clean in her maybe Metcons or something. This is There's so many things about this that are just absolutely outrageous. It looks like she could muscle clean that conceivably. It's so high. If she tried, yeah. Like, it's so much bare height. Almost no foot movement. No crazy kind of frog stance or starfish stance in the catch. Very, very nice rack position and pull under. Like, no low elbows in that kind of lower catch position. So, so good. The power is insane. Yeah, it's the power that really... 
took the biscuit for me watching this at 17. She's a CrossFitter. She said, not. My focus has not been on lifting lately. So I'm pretty happy, but my body's still able to pull it out of the bag when needed. Just read that again. My focus has not been on lifting lately. So, like, if you're a weightlifter, generally, when it comes to female weightlifters and power clean to full clean ratio, sometimes you can see a massive discrepancy, and sometimes you can see, like, a 5 to 10 kilo discrepancy, depending. A, a lot of the time, if they are very, very strong, you can see a big discrepancy. So, you know, if she was full-time weightlifting, you could be looking at like a 120 at least here, maybe even more depending on her efficiency. So that's uh, that's pretty insane. Yeah, it's crazy to think as well that she's probably just gone through the CrossFit Open. Yes. It's probably at her most aerobically conditioned that she'll be in throughout the year, depending on what her competition schedule is. But it's certainly not just after big strength training phase. Yeah. You'd say something if somebody had just done a massive back squat cycle, they were kind of doing some lifting, but particularly when it's during the open season, it's mental to think those weights are being hit. Yeah, that's actually crazy. That's a good point. Now, speaking of mental weights we're hitting, we've got Lee Sang Young, or just affectionately known as Lee Sang, squatting 250 kilos for a set of four, and I'm sure, I'm just... I'm thinking at least 275, 280. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to see what he ends up peaking. And when you put it in perspective, I think he said he was around 75 in one of these posts, so he's competing as a 73. So, like, 3.4 more body weight multiplier. So you have to just, you know, it's really, to put it into perspective, how crazy that is. Yeah, I think we're going to look back on the last three months and the next two months of Lee Sang squatting, and it will be looked at not quite in the same way as like Ilya 2014 or something. No. But this squat cycle could be a documentary in itself. Like we've seen some of the most inset- insane sets of 20s, 15s, 12s, 10s, 6s. Now we have 4s. I think we're going to see an insane one around at the end of it. I would love to watch a Netflix squat documentary on Lee Sang's yeah, progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be great if they started off and he was doing really poorly on something and he was like missing things. But he oh, didn't. yeah. But that just doesn't seem to happen for or him. Or if he started off going really well and then had a major incident and then went very poorly and then went again, you know, that kind of second, that second bump on afterwards. Yeah, if I'd close up some weird filter on his face and him just like grinding through big neck veins... So Lee Sang also put up 190 kilos for two singles on the clean and jerk. Obviously, he's going for, you know, he'll need a massive clean and jerk. And like, I think he'll probably need to put up a 200 clean and jerk, maybe 198 in Thailand to prove. Obviously, South Korea only have minimum slots to send athletes as well. I think it's a three or so. So like, he'll need to really prove himself. His snatch could be his downfall because he needs to snatch well into the 150s especially because a little birdie has told me she's young is in the best shape he's been in in a long time. A little inside source. And someone is actually training on his platform. <laughs> and he said the, she's in the best shape he's been in a long time. So there's a lot of big contenders in that 73 kilo class, which is going to be great. And, you know, Lee's going to need to prove himself. I'm going to say he'd want to be put up at 200 clean okay. check. I think he could. I definitely think looking at this, so in the last few weeks we've seen 191, 193 and 194, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, and now this is multiple sets at 190. These 190s are noticeably better. No straps either. Yes, it's a very good point. So noticeably better, way more consistent, no straps. Like it is getting more and more refined as the weeks go on. So I'd say we could see something massive in Thailand. How fun would it be to be a coach at this point in some of the bigger national teams? You know, yes. China, South Korea, maybe, you know, who, other, who else is kind of knocking around with a lot of big lifters? Italy. Italy, yeah. It'd be great just to be, not in a crucial position, just where you're part of the buzz, but it wasn't like your entire <laughs> your entire career on the line, you know? Yeah, because it's also an incredibly stressful time. <laughs> <laughs> so here we've got Salfred um, Konda. She is incredible lifter, absolutely one of the best female lifters currently lifting. And this is, I think it was a Nordic Championships, and she clean and jerked 145 casually. Yeah. Casual. Insane. That clean looks like an 85% clean, mm-hmm. if even. Clean looks very, very good. Her really interesting thing on the jerk is how wide her grip is. Yes. Like, she's not a massive human being it, by any stretch of the imagination. Yet her grip is so wide on that jerk and it she locks it out phenomenally well. Like her overhead positions are always so secure, always so stable. We never see 
the kind of common thing so certain nations will obviously have that super wide jerk grip we'll see a lot of the south american lifters reaching their hands out and when they go overhead it tends to be a really fast lockout because obviously the distance to locking out the bar is much shorter but we can see some stability issues in the shoulder we never see that with salford it's also a very very strong shoulder position overhead she also has 50 kilo plates here which must be an absolute mindfuck my god i uh, i think that looks like a german one of the German training halls, that distinctly brown matting. <laughs> yes, it's either that or a university. Yeah. So back from some squats again from Team China. We also have this comparison of Lu Huanhua or Li Huanhua. I actually can't even remember, lads. It's 270 kilos, Giga Chad. And comparison of his 275 back squat when he was in the lighter weight class. And now probably more than 10 kilos body weight gained here is 270 kilo front squat and the 270 front squat looks a lot easier than the 275 back squeezy by god yeah and obviously the body weight gain makes a massive difference here but there's a lot of strength training being done in between there as well so Mm. i don't think if you're if you're squatting 170 and you're struggling with it gaining 10 kilos in the next few months probably won't get you to front squat 170 as easily as he does it here or what's that front squat 270 yeah 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 but the, the body weight gain does help, but there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. So we also have this comparison, two years apart, a 40 kilo increase in the back squat. So one of them is 260, notably quite high, just uh, it's quite interesting and a big hip shift. And then this 300 kilo back squat as a 102. Yeah, it just shows you can improve technique as the weight goes up as well. Mm-hmm. Like it's noticeably better. Is there years on this curve or do we know what the difference is? Two years. Two years. Yeah, geez, that's a massive change. So, obviously, for those strength lifts, like Fitz is saying, is that as you get stronger, you can uh, improve technique. So a lot of times, technique is dependent on your strength in big high force lifts and big strength lifts. So it's different from weightlifting, where a lot of times technique actually can get a bit worse, especially in the snatch as you gain weight. But in the back squat, sometimes as you go up in weight, and if you get stronger and you're doing the right things, the technique can improve. Now, not all the time, but it's definitely a strong possibility. Now, here we've got John Hack looking more juicy than ever with 420 kilo deadlift. So this is a PB. I'm pretty sure this is a 10 kilo PB. And he said he should have just loaded the 8 red, which I assume might have been 425 maybe. Or would that just have rounded it to 420 without the clips? Yeah, I, I, I actually don't know. This that, looked pretty easy. It looks insanely easy. This is... His deadlift form and the way he approaches maximal deadlifts is he's definitely my favorite powerlifter in the world in terms of no messing around, a very, very standard conventional stance, not a crazy narrow stance either, which we see a lot of the competition powerlifters going for at the moment. But the main thing is the not overly exaggerated dynamic start. Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't develop a massive amount of tension. He literally just bends over and picks up the bar and it works so, so well for him. Is that just a testament to what his body is made of? We were talking last week about people's uh, neural capacity in terms of recruiting motor units. And there's some interesting research coming from Imperial College of London talking about is there a maximum limit to how fast human neurons could be recruited or motor units could be recruited based on people's neural capacity and there was huge discrepancy obviously it doesn't take you know it has to be studied but it's that's very obvious if you look at one person jumping compared to another person jumping but then what's going on with like john hack's body yeah. you know like what is what is he made of like what's so different from him you know i i think the real thing there is that oftentimes we'll say oh it would be the muscle fiber type distribution and that he is fast twitch or his proportion of fast twitch to slow twitch is more favorable but there's 20 things going on here that he's better than everyone at. Mm-hmm. Like the the integrity of his his tendon units, the integrity of his ligaments, also those neurological structures and probably how much he's developed those neurological structures is absolutely insane. Like he's, if you were to put him in formaldehyde, formaldehyde and cut him open and just see what's going on inside oh, there. Oh, there's people who'd like to do that. <laughs> there is people. I'd say we'd see some crazy tendon thickness. <laughs> So next we've got from the Australian strength coach, I think he's coaching Berserker, who is a lifter we've seen a couple of times now benching. And he's benching, this is an all-time Australian bench press record. 
277 and a half kilos or 611 pounds in competition and very legit pause like really no doubt about it in terms of that pause that's beautiful competition for him there's a, a real there's a really defining shape to people who have massive bench presses and it's that they're absolutely gigantic. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah. Like, I, you're never going to be bench pressing over 250 kilos unless you're absolutely humongous. I, I would add an asterisk to that, like, legit bench presses. Yes, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. When it's, like, full round, long pause. Raw, without a suit or yeah. without a shirt or whatever. It's, he's, that's such a good bench. Actually, sometimes the shirt benchers get massive and they just put a load of tissue on just to stretch the shirt more. Yes. So they have just more, doesn't even muscle, fat, muscle, everything just to make it even stretch or to get more mechanical tension. More tightness in there. More tightness. So Vasa <laughs> benching, two, you know, the problem with this 277 and a half is obviously it's a ridiculously impressive bench press, but we look at so many big bench presses every week on the new show that this was in danger of not being included, even though it's ridiculous. And that's crazy. I also think the thing with this weight of bench press is there's absolutely no point of reference. Yeah. Like, us doing any amount of bench press is so far away from what that is. Mm. Like, you can you can understand deadlifts, you can understand squats, even when they're crazy, crazy heavy. But this is in a complete different realm of strength discrepancy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. From Vasa. <laughs> now, here we've got... Zach Rule, someone sent this in from uh, Instagram. So he is, doesn't seem to have legs below the knee looking at this. And he's benching 182 and a half kilos for three sets of three. And from what I saw, someone said he was weighing pretty light as well. So somewhere in like the 70 kilo range. I love this bench press form, specifically mm. in terms of the wrist position, is how well stacked it is. So he's not perfectly straight but there's no amount of huge flare like it's a really nice position as you you see that really nice angles in his forearm and his wrist when he's pressing yeah and that those angles in the forearm as well coming from those elbows not flaring up crazy to the side you know mm-hmm. like that's a super close grip bench press yeah that's what if you're an athlete and you're not bench pressing for competition this is how you should be bench pressing oh yeah that grip basically straight out from your shoulders or if you were to set your thumb into your shoulder that's roughly where your grip width is it's, these are just, they're just good old-fashioned strong bench presses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his best ever bench press is 501 pounds. Oh, my God. So... 230 kilos? Yeah. Absolutely insane weights. Mm. Now we've got AJ Sharma, who is back squatting 325 kilos for a double absolutely speed reps this is crazy he said that it's a certain video he says like i want to make it fly or something you know so i assumed that there's going to be a failure or he's going to bump it over his head or something mm-hmm. or something like that but in fact he was just doing kind of semi plyometric jumps at the top with this this is how you hope your throwers would squat 325 or something <laughs> or even 300 in training yeah or the first day of off-season training with a football team or a rugby team and you get the front rows in you know mm-hmm. big boys start squatting like this you know you're in for a good off-season yeah <laughs> good depth on these two as well it's not uh, not very questionable i don't think so really moving speed on these as well so be interesting to see where he goes he looks quite young as well i'm not quite sure of his age but uh, he doesn't look he doesn't look to be around for too long 26 so obviously for strength it is something that is you know built in decades and be very interesting to see what he ends up squatting. That looks like someone who can squat 400 plus, surely. Yeah, definitely. Or, or at some stage, we'll get to that 400 kilo plus mark. Definitely. Next, we've got uh, Denise Herber, who we've seen the show a good few times, specifically, f- usually for her deadlifting. And she hit a PB deadlift, conventional, 290 kilos, another superb deadlift technician like John Hack. Oh my God, yeah. You're probably looking at one of the best female deadlifters in the world here. Yeah. Or in my opinion, anyway. It is, obviously, a few weeks ago, she was talking about being a few weeks out from testing. I assume this is the test. There's not There's not some competition or something coming No, no, out. she said 20 days out. Okay. Yeah, so obviously. Yeah, by God. Uh, just insanely impressive with the deadlift. I think there's a lot to be learned from this. The first thing that you should learn from it is just the, the importance of consistency. So... A few weeks ago, when we were watching your deadlift, there was no major breakdown, even though it was a near maximal set. In this case, it is a fully maximal set, or it's a new PR for, and we still don't see any technical breakdown. 
a lot of the time when we're consistently pushing deadlifts or any pulls hard enough, people start leaving it slip a small bit in the way where a small bit of upper back flexion, maybe a small bit of elbow flexion at the start, and they say, well, it doesn't really matter because it's maximal. Um, but it really, really matters, and you should be focusing on it as much as these elite athletes are focusing on it if you want to get anywhere near where they're trying to get to. Also, I'm pretty sure this is done beltless as well, which is crazy. Oh my God, I yeah. don't know if you've ever seen her wear a belt, so this maybe it's not unusual for her. So the world record is 291 for what she's heading for. And what's great to see is just loads of really nice comments in this. So yeah. that's fantastic to see. Hopefully everything keeps going that direction. Instagram comments, obviously similar technical attributes that we love to see in the deadlift. Like John Hack, it was toes straightforward. Generally toes or feet under the hips, but a little bit of leeway for that depending on your leverages and your body. Uh, shoulders aren't super far in front of the barbell. So generally aiming for on top of the barbell, never behind the barbell before you start pulling. And then nice, short, single hip pump. So dynamic start, huge, great reasons to use that in terms of stretch shortening cycle to get more power, more work done off the floor. Uh, so especially if you suck off the floor and it's not your positions, you just don't have that force available to you. Might be worth looking into a bit more of an aggressive dynamic start. Nothing crazy, but any amount of pre-stretch on those muscles will help you produce more force. Now here we've got something that's quite interesting we've been taking note of for a while and it's probably only a matter of time that someone tried to make this happen but there's a couple of Irish lads gone over looking for positions in American football and one of them, Daryl Leader, who used to play rugby, did 23 reps on a 225 kilo bench press at his pro day. So if you're not aware, there's two big sports in Ireland that involve a lot of kicking and specifically over a bar similar to American football. There is obviously rugby, which a lot of the kickers on the team actually don't do. Or there's not a lot of kickers on the team. Very few members of the team will actually do a lot of kicking. But then you'll have uh, Gaelic football, where everyone on the team can kick and kicks. It's probably the most popular sport or the most touch sport across the nation. Certainly in uh, you know this generation or previous generations, everyone would have kicked the ball at some stage. So it was only a matter of time before some of those someone tried to make something happen and it seems to be that there's a few maybe two or three from what i can see are getting somewhere with it so it's very very interesting um the the transferability it's like let's just talk about there with the russian new team it's numbers game when you come to like extreme talent and there's certainly the numbers of people kicking bars or kicking balls over the bar in ireland so it's uh it'll be interesting to see how this transpires yeah it's a there's some funny parallels here so obviously in this case, it's lads who played rugby before. Maybe they played Gaelic football when they were younger. In previous years, there's been some really high-level rugby players and rugby coaches go over to NFL teams and then be kind of rumoured of having contracts and things like that over there. Or people trying to tempt them. One of the most obvious cases is Ron Nogara. Obviously, they tried to get him to go over as a kicker at the end of his career. But in this case, Irish rugby players have something that 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 kicking game that a lot of other countries don't have and notably you'd have like South African rugby teams getting Irish coaches going over there for the kicking and catching element of it just to focus on that with some of their players I think there's a massive market for talented young players like this going over getting a special teams position obviously in this case it's a kicker but there might be some other applications as well uh, so it's exciting it's class I hope it's something we see we see more of in the next few years. So it seems to be four or five of them went to the first ever group of Irish athletes to attend the NFL Combine. So that's very, very interesting. So it will be very interesting to see how that transpires mm. over the next couple of years. Now, here we've got a regular massive hang power cleaner, Anna Da Silva. So she is a thrower and she put up this PB 142 kilo double for power clean which is insane now i suppose the comment on the technique is something that we've kind of defended her before it's something we said look we wouldn't coach athletes to do that but it's not really a problem if it's not hurting first of all then it's a major major part of that problem is gone so obviously we would coach a hang power clean different but there is no reason for this not to benefit her and what she's looking for so she's looking for power production moving head weight fast extending fast relaxing getting under the barbell all those great things that we've talked about before that the clean does for 
power development and she's getting that and that's what she needs for her sport is contracting, relaxing, contracting. And if the barbell moves fast and she's moving through those extensions, she's getting the benefits of it. People mightn't like that, but that is the objective truth of that when it comes to it. Is it the prettiest? No. But is it massive weights and is it getting the benefit? Yeah, absolutely. And if we're being perfectly honest, I think a lot of the time we see negative commentary around that, particularly like cases like this where it's athletes maybe from outside the sport of weightlifting and their technique looks a bit different. Most of that negative commentary is coming from that athlete lifting significant more, significantly more than the person who's lifting in the video and then feeling in some way that they have to get a little jab in. Mm-hmm. And that's usually what it is here. Like when we look at this from a, if you were a paid S&C coach, coaching Anna in this case you look at that and you'd say okay it's non-standard technique it's not usually what we coach is there anything dangerous happening here so we don't have any crazy star fishing which is putting the knees or the hips in a poor position we don't have the back particularly like that upper and mid back being pulled into a rounded position in the catch there's definitely no risk with her elbows or rack position there she's catching it very very solid each time even though she's wearing those pulling straps so there is no added risk here and she's doing phenomenal weights with it so it's it's getting exactly what you want as you said and like the thing with olympic lifts for athletes and perfect technique is that would perfect technique get you more kilos yes but how much time does an athlete have to waste you know a fresh athletes have short careers they have careers that are always in jeopardy if you're carded athletes you know a lot of country systems are pretty ruthless you have one bad season and that's half your funding a third of your funding uh, gone re- almost straight away in a lot of countries you know and how long do you have to reduce some of your really important attributes and something like throwing requires obviously a huge amount of power output so at what point can you jeopardize and say okay we're gonna focus on better technique this could take six months mm. a year to get weightlifting technique or better technique for that and what would that do to her performance in the short run you know so it is it's something you try and address of course but ultimately when you're a professional athlete you do have to make some of those changes and to be honest sometimes athletes just don't give a shit yeah they just don't care <laughs> they just want to move the weight lots of athletes don't like their snc sessions they don't no. want to do snc sessions chores are a bit different but track and field athletes a lot of them are like oh they just want to get it done. They want to spend as little time in the gym as possible. They don't want to go to the gym as much as possible. Even though it might be good for them, they don't need to. They don't care that much, you know. And as much as maybe weightlifting people might look at this and hate to see that, but a lot of them just actually just don't give a... F- they just do not care. No. They'll turn around to you after five years of training and say, is the Bulgarian split squat the one with your foot up behind? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they don't... Not saying Anna is one of these athletes. Absolutely not, no. But that is quite common in the professional. <laughs> so here we've got a freak of nature, as everyone knows, and Tom Haviland doing kneeling start to two vertical jumps. So he did eight sets of this. Started off unweighted and worked up to an additional... 15 kilo vest he said somewhere recently in one of the comments that he was like 325 pounds so i think that makes him 145 ish kilos mm. so undoubtedly getting air there yeah it's it's insane to think you're adding 15 kilos and it doesn't really put that much of a dampener on your vertical jump yes like those those vertical jumps are really hard to do if you've ever done them just doing that jump up from the knees and then immediately producing force is difficult to do. You tend to have a, a higher degree of flexion at the knee and at the hip than you do from just a standard counter movement jump. So it does take a lot of force to do it. And he's, I'm not going to put a number on that jump because we said someone had a 40 inch jump a few weeks ago and they didn't. But that's a that's a high jump. He's six foot eight, I think. So he's, if you look at him clearing halfway up his quad, that's a significant difference or distance. He's also six foot seven and a bit of a mystery man, but he seems, if you read his replies in the comments, he seems very polite and nice, you know, because someone was like, oh, you do incredibly well in Special Forces Week. And he said, I tend to cry when get shouted at. <laughs> Which I don't, I don't think that's true. But he is also doing some rocking through the Australian jungle. Is that a Malinois? That looks like it. It looks bit. like it, yeah. Uh, is it the jungle? Is, do they call it the jungle? They don't, the bush. No, the bush. Yeah. You yeah. never heard Australians call it the jungle, but I'm pretty sure it is full of dangerous monsters and that uh, tom haviland's one of those in there with a weighted vest on and he's belgian malinois imagine walking through that woods and you, you're like oh i'm in australia i'm gonna get bitten by a snake stung by a spider something like that's gonna kill me mm-hmm. then you see a malinois coming and you say oh 
It's the most dangerous dog in the world. That's going to murder me. <laughs> and then you see a six foot seven monster coming. Yeah. It's time to turn around and go back to the car. Eat his dates. <laughs> Next, and to finish off, we've got this wrestler. Don't know who it is. It's from a wrestling page. The wrestling page, I think, is a Kyrgyzstani wrestling page. We don't know who the wrestler is. But here is a 105 kilo full snatch. And I was so surprised at this. I could not get over how good a quality this snatch is. So if he is in Kyrgyzstan, and Kyrgyzstan obviously have a national weightlifting team. There's some handful of very good lifters. But I was expecting some crazy hang power snatch. Maybe even a no contact muscle snatch or something ludicrous. But... Mm. No, this is... He does certain things really well here. The most non-weightlifters will never do, no matter how much they work in it. And the first thing is the sweep back off the floor. That initial movement to the barbell having a rearward component in it is so, so important. And he does that phenomenally well. We're obviously coaching a lot of athletes, a lot of people on programs. We see a lot of amateur weightlifters every single week and giving them feedback. And this is something we're constantly trying to get them to work on. The second thing, and it's probably the most second issue pe- or second most common issue people have, is that they make too much contact at the top. They absolutely smash the living daylights out of the bar, and the barbell swings out and around because of that. He has a very, very nice vertical extension here. It's a, it's exemplary technique. You know, a lot of times people are like, "Oh, if American weightlifters or American weightlifters had all their American football players weightlifting, they'd see some freaks." And obviously, we agree with that. Some of the numbers, but I actually don't think most of them would be as good as if you took a lot of the wrestlers or the throwers from American sports. Because one of the big things you see and that you need in weightlifting is lack of fragility. Weightlifting is a sport that is something you're going to be hurt a lot, but you need to keep performing with that pain very, very frequently. So there'll be non-acute injuries, you know, inflammation of joints that will sporadically occur, and you still need to perform and put up those numbers. And I think if you were to compare... Fragility is a wrong word, but resilience is probably a better mm. word in terms of the physicality. I think their wrestlers would be far better in terms of if you could pin them down. Yeah. And then there's obviously arguments about anatomy and limb lengths and stuff in regards to that, so there's a lot more to it. But I think uh, I think you'd see just as many good weightlifters, if not more, come from wrestling and, and the throwers from America than you would just see American football players. They seem to get injured a lot. I also think you could cut a wrestler's hand off and he'd still be able to work. No, I'll do. I'll try the snatches today. No, I'll give, I'll give it a go. No, no, it's okay. My finger's missing, but I don't need that one anyway. No, I've got other hands. <laughs> Thanks for watching today's new show. Appreciate all the people who send in everything for the new show. Obviously, go through every single one of those every week, so I look at all of them, and we really do appreciate it. Obviously, it makes the show much better than it would be otherwise than if we were... Uh, in just doing it ourselves so this for example is a great example of that the wrestler so check out the Seek of Strength weightlifting and SNC camp and check out the Seek of Strength app on iOS and Android maybe you're a wrestler and you need to improve your squatting or your pulling or you need to become a bit more of a horse for your wrestling you can check that out on the Seek of Strength and iOS Android app <laughs>